Good evening and good morning and welcome. My name is Ramona Handelbaima. I am Japan Society's Chief Program Officer. I'm very honored to be introducing tonight's program to all of you. Um, our topic today can't be more important. Um, it addresses climate change in the blue economy. Um, climate change is affecting me, it's affecting you, it's affecting all of us, but its impact on the ocean and marine life um, is uh, unquestionable. And tonight's an opportunity to really explore what that means. Um, we know that increased ocean temperatures and rising sea levels are issues affecting island communities globally, and none more so than Okinawa, um, the archipelago to the south of Japan. Um, Okinawa, um, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, be the host of this particular topic tonight because 2022 is a very special year in Okinawan history. It's an important year for Japan society. We are devoting an, an entire year of programming to understanding its richness and complexity um, to mark the 50 year anniversary of its reversion from US occupation to Japan. So the site for tonight's conversation about climate change and the blue economy couldn't be more appropriate. Um, in addition to understanding it, we will also learn what is this um, uh, thing that we call the blue economy from experts who are thinking about it on a daily basis. So I'm looking forward to understanding with you what the blue economy is, its opportunities, but also its challenges in the face of the effects of climate change. Um, but first, um, we, we couldn't do this today without um, really generous support from our sponsors. So please uh, afford me a minute to give them special appreciation. Um, our global leader, City, our corporate partners, Deloitte, Mizuho Americas, Toyota Motor North America. And I'm also very grateful to thank um, that this event is in part of the U.S.-Japan Dialogue, leveraging S&T towards sustainability and resiliency program. Um, this program is made possible from, um, by a grant from the Toshiba International Foundation, and it's co-organized by Japan Society's dear friends, comrades, and colleagues at OIST Foundation, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation. Um, I'm going to introduce now my, my colleague and comrade, David James of OIST, for his welcoming remarks. He is the president and CEO of OIST Foundation. Um, and the Chief Advancement Officer of, of OIST. So um, thank you, David. Thank you to our speakers. I can't wait to take notes and start learning from all of you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ramona, for that great introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good morning, if you're in Japan or other parts of Asia. Uh, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us for tonight's important webinar on climate change and the blue economy. Uh, also, happy uh, Lunar New Year to everyone that is celebrated in Okinawa and, of course, many parts of Asia. Uh, I am extremely pleased that the OIST Foundation, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation, is co-organizing tonight's event uh, with the Japan Society. As you heard from Ramona, we're dear friends and colleagues and uh, greatly enjoy collaborating on projects together. Uh, so very excited about this. Uh, this is a series of programs that we're doing, and tonight is the second uh, webinar. The Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, located in Okinawa, also known as OIST, uh, is an interdisciplinary and international graduate school, which offers a five-year PhD in science. Uh, for those who don't know us, we opened our doors 10 years ago, and we aim to produce groundbreaking research for the benefit of all humankind. And in 2019, Nature Magazine ranked us number one in Japan and number ninth globally for scientific research quality. Come a long way in a short time. The OIST Foundation uh, is a US nonprofit organization based here in New York, and we support scientific breakthroughs, innovation, and the sustainable development of Okinawa through OIST. At OIST, we have a world-class marine science team, and OIST Marine Genomics Unit was the first place to decode a coral genome. From here, we have great plans to expand our research and our impact. Without further ado, please let me introduce tonight's moderator, a good friend and colleague, 
Dr. Robert Dunbar. Dr. Dunbar is the W.M. Keck Professor in the School of Earth Sciences and Senior Fellow at the Woods Institute for Environment at Stanford University. He also serves as the OIST Foundation Climate and Ocean Ambassador, and he chairs OIST's Marine Science Advisory Board. His research and teaching interests include climate dynamics, oceanography, marine ecology, and biogeochemistry, and he has a deep interest in environmental policy directed toward problem solving. He's also a trustee for the Consortium for Ocean Leadership in Washington, DC. Rob, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, good morning, day or evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on climate change in the blue economy. Uh, this is an engaging and timely topic uh, with the rollout of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Many of us are working to understand the challenges that climate change poses to the oceans, as well as the opportunities provided by growth of the blue economy, and in particular synergies between the two. If we're gonna get this right, we've gotta do it in a smart way. And I have no doubt that OIST, uh, the World Bank and Japan all have key roles to play. So we've got two speakers for you who are well positioned to educate us on these topics. We'll hear their presentations first, uh, have some moderated discussion time and then entertain questions from the audience. Please use the question box in YouTube at any time. Our first speaker is Timothy Ravazzi. Dr. Ravazzi is a professor of marine sciences and principal investigator of the Marine Climate Change Unit at OIST. He's also an adjunct professor at the Australian Research Council's Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies at James Cook University. And at OIST, Tim has built a multidisciplinary research program that looks at, at climate change impacts on coral reefs and in particular on fish communities. And I wanna add that, that Tim is part of an of an extraordinary group of marine scientists at, at OIS that in my view and the view of many others, they're changing our concepts of use inspired science. I'll introduce our second speaker now at this time. So we've got better flow later on. Dr. Charlotte de Fontaubert is senior fisheries specialist at the World Bank where she is global lead for the blue economy and program lead for Pro Blue, a multi-donor trust fund that supports sustainable and integrated development of marine and coastal resources. Charlotte co-wrote Sunken Billions Revisited, the World Bank's eye-opening report on global fishing. I say eye-opening because it opened my eyes four years ago when I first read it. And I've since assigned it to students in quite a few of my classes. So kudos for that production. Uh, Charlotte is also a research fellow at the Center for Marine Resource Studies at the School for Field Studies in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Uh, that sounds like a wonderful gig. Um, Tim, why don't you go ahead and, and kick us off and uh, then we'll transition to Charlotte. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, uh, Rob, for the very nice introduction. <clears throat> thank you for the Japanese Society for uh, uh, you know, invite me here. I'm actually very excited about this. So um, thank you, David and the OIST Foundation and OIST. Can you see my screen? Okay. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay. So, uh, okay, so today I want to give you an update of what's going on in terms of coral reef in Okinawa and maybe also around the world uh, in the context of climate change and maybe touch a little bit about blue economy or for what I understand about blue economy. I think Charlotte will explain to us much better. So, uh, before starting, I want to give you a message. So this is a video of a coral reef in Papua New Guinea, not in Okinawa, and I took this video two years ago. This is a very remote location uh, where there is no or zero impact, human impact. And scientists like me, climate scientists or coral reef scientists, believe that this is a coral reef, how coral reef will look like 100, 200 years ago before uh, the industrial revolution. 
what you can notice here is the amount of biodiversity of the coral and the fish, but also the biomass, the combination of fish and how many coral there are. Unfortunately, these are only the few reefs in the world left in this condition. So, uh, including here in Okinawa. Why? Because we have this problem, which is a, a planet problem, global problem, it's called climate change due to the increasing of uh, CO2, uh, atmospheric CO2, or carbon dioxide for the production, you know, driving car, burning coil. And, um, and what this cause is uh, basically a global warming of the earth and including the ocean and including coral reef, but also the CO2 or carbon dioxide is picked up by the ocean, decreasing the pH or making the ocean more acidic. By changing the temperature and the uh, pH, we basically change the chemistry of the ocean. And we believe, we have been scientists believe that that can have the detrimental effect on coral reef ecosystem, ecosystem in general, but in particular coral reef ecosystem. On top of that, in particular here in Okinawa and Japan, uh, there is what we call secondary more localized anthropogenic stress. So climate change is global, but then depend on where you live, or, you know, or, or the, the politics uh, or the country you live, there is other stressor, which to me, especially here in Okinawa, are actually more urgent to deal with compared to the general climate change. Uh, here in Okinawa, a problem with tropicalization, I don't have time to go through. Uh, overfishing, as you know, Japan, uh, the fish is deep into the culture as a food, the sashimi, the sushi, and in Japan, there is a lot of people, so they need to fish a lot of fish. Uh, and in particular in Okinawa, we have a problem of urbanization and coastal development. And I will show you later on a little bit more. Um, this, I told you, this is a global phenomenon across the entire planet Earth, uh, climate change in particular. But we believe that the coral reef, which they lie here in the blue line, that is the 20 degree isotherm. So basically coral reef, they don't grow if the water is uh, uh, colder than 20 degrees. Uh, but what I want to point out here, these are ecosystems that's already adapted to an extreme environment. Why? Because around this area, temperature of the water doesn't change much during the season. And we think that uh, uh, slightly changing temperature, as predicted by <clears throat> the end of the century, they can actually uh, have a strong impact on coral reefs, even more so than other oceans, for example, here and here. Okay, so they're more sensitive to these uh, induced changes. So uh, why we bother to study coral reef? Why we think are important? Well, of course, as a scientist, we need to know uh, what's going on to you know, biodiversity in the future if we keep in changing environments as we do. But in terms of this talk and the blue economy, uh, I'll give an example of Japan and Okinawa. So uh, climate change can have so profound socioeconomic implication in the future. Japan is almost $40 billion a year, US dollar, or commercial fishing industry, right? If we deplete all the fish around Okinawa and entire Japan, that could be a very big socioeconomic implication. Here in Okinawa, tourism before the coronavirus pandemic generate roughly every year five to six billion dollars a year for tourism. And Okinawa is the poorest prefecture in Japan. So the only economy Okinawa has is tourism. If we destroy all the coral reef around Okinawa, we will not have any more tourists and therefore the economy will crash. So they are very important socioeconomic problem. So let me just introduce you uh, the coral reef of Okinawa. So Okinawa is here, that is the world, that is the southernmost part of Japan. Uh, and here on the left side is another map of Japan. So is uh, Okinawa or Ryuka Archipelago is between the East China Sea and the Pacific Ocean. And here is where the Ryuko Archipelago is. And what you can see here, the red dot, that is where the coral reef in Japan lies. So basically the coral reef of Japan is 90% is in the Ryuko Archipelago, where Okinawa is. Here is another zoom in of the Ryuko Archipelago. So here is Okinawa Island, where I am now, and where Oist is. And here is the southern uh, Ryukyu, so we're close to Taiwan. And here is the northern Ryukyu, also Amami Island is called which are not part of the Okinawa prefecture, actually are part of the Keisho prefecture. Uh, that to put you in the context. But again, on the right side here, on the red or pink dot, these are where the, most of the coral reef in Japan lie, basically where I am now. So what are the biggest problems in Okinawa? How is the, uh, so, uh, you know, the, the state of the coral reef? Unfortunately, it's not the great. 
If you look here on the right side, in the past 20 years, there is the decline in coverage of coral reefs. Why? Well, the, not because, also because of climate change, but specifically in Okinawa, we have three problems. The outbreak of uh, uh, crown of thorn, so this is a starfish here and eating coral. And um, but what happened that these uh, animals, these starfish, if the water temperature is increasing, like predicted by climate change, is more productive, so they reproduce faster. So they have more of these and they eat more coral. And that is a big problem. Another thing is there's red soil runoff here on the left side, bottom left. So Okinawa, there is a lot of farming, but normally purple yam around the, uh, basically on the shore. And being a tropical place is raining a lot. And there is a lot of runoff from this farming through the coral reef, including pesticide. And we try to understand how these impact the coral reef. But the major problem in this two picture is massive land reclamation project. Uh, as I told you, Okinawa uh, economy is based on tourism. So they keep in building a lot of a huge hotel on the shore because all the tourists want to have a nice view and want to be uh, close to the coral reef. In the last few years, we also have another problem of land reclamation due to the military bases, US military bases, with the tension between China and, and US and other country, Taiwan, in the South China Sea, the US military is expanding the bases in Okinawa, but reclaiming a lot of land and a lot of seashore. So uh, together with my colleague at the, the University of Ryukyu, so uh, we did this exercise where we went all around the Okinawa main island and tried to classify the impact of the coast. So at uh, natural, an example, that is pristine, so there is no human impact. Uh, soft harmony, maybe like in this case here in B, so where there is just a street or like a, a separation between the uh, vegetation and the coral reef. Uh, hard harmony, so where you start to build the street, or also here is a wall to protection for tsunami, or even the worst is land reclamation. Look at this picture D. Here it was the original line of the coastline. And here in Naha, we reclaim all these to build, for example, this giant hotel here. So these are the major problems. So if you look, if you do this as a size, look around Okinawa, it doesn't look good. Look on the right side here. And you don't want to see red. Red is when land filling. Okay, that is south of uh, Okinawa, where Naha is, the main city. Now I'm here in Yomitan, Oist is here. Uh, so basically, uh, we have a problem. So there is a lot of land reclamation, uh, a lot of hard and soft harmony. But the positive news is if you look Cape Edo up north here, there is a lot of green lines. So there is still a lot of natural coastline. And why we did this is because now we can go for stakeholder and try to convince them at least to protect the left uh, natural coastline that we still have in Okinawa. 63% of the coastline in Okinawa is altered by human. No good. So uh, that is one of the biggest problems we have in Okinawa. But in terms of coral bleaching, to be honest, Okinawa is pretty good. So we didn't see any coral bleaching. Coral bleaching is when the coral lose the uh, symbiotic algae, so it becomes white. And if it doesn't recover, the algae will start to death, and then it will die. But recently, with my team, we went to an expedition in a different type of island in Japan, Ogasawara Island. This is a Bonin Island, part of Micronesia. Here, here in red, so here is Tokyo. Here is Naha, Okinawa, where I am now. And this is a zoom in of the island. Why I want to show you these slides? Because you can see here, it's pretty much the same latitude of uh, where I am now, Okinawa. But in Okinawa, there is no coral bleaching. But in September 2021, we noticed a massive coral bleaching. Here, picture took it underwater by myself. And you can see here is coral. You can see that it's white. Even anemone and anemone fish, they're bleaching. And that is not very good. But the, the curiosity here is that it's, you know, the temperature of water is very similar to what we have in Okinawa. But maybe because of uh, secondary effect or more localized effect, the coral is more susceptible to bleaching compared to the one in Okinawa. So the point is we have to be careful and not generalize how we can protect the coral reef because strongly depend on local effect. So my last few slides. So how we can help, so uh, at least here in Okinawa, uh, well, in OIST, together with my pro uh, colleague, Professor Norisato, uh, we start a uh, um, clownfish and also coral restoration project. I'm in charge of the clownfish project. This is together with the Ayat Hotel and the tourist industry in Okinawa. So here is the Ayat Hotel. It's a very fancy hotel. In uh, This is the OIST Marine Station. Here is OIST, this is the Marine Station. Here's where the Ayat. 
And here we identify an area where we can maybe try to uh, uh, restore clownfish. Why clownfish? This is the clownfish local of Okinawa. It's the most popular fish in Okinawa. So all tourists come here to see the Nemo, right? Nemo is the most recognizable fish in the world. And this declining in Okinawa because of the land reclamation, but unfortunately also because of butchery. So people want to collect pair of clownfish to keep in aquaria in their homes. So we notice a massive uh, decrease of, uh, uh, of clownfish. So how we start this uh, pile of restoration project? Here is the site, uh, the yellow dot, where we restore clownfish. Here are local, uh, so clownfish that are, were already there. How we do that? In the Oise Marine Station, we collect wild breeding pair from the coral reef. We keep it in aquaria, in captivity, in the marine station, and we let it spawn. Here you can see eggs of uh, clownfish, pair of clownfish in the oyster uh, laboratory. And then we grow them until juvenile. Here you can see baby Nemo swimming in the oyster marine station. When they reach a certain, uh, a certain size, we go to restore them. Here is two my team members, Rocky and Jeff, restoring one pair of clownfish uh, in front of the higher on the anemone. So we, of course, we do a lot of genetic study to, to see the genetic flow or how to restore uh, uh, fish are. So we check them, we tag them. Here you can see the tag, the clownfish. We monitor in every month uh, with video, but also uh, by scuba diving. And you can see here this project seems like it's working. In fact, when we come back after a few months, you can see the fish they're growing and they're very healthy and happy. And hopefully next June they will spawn. So this is a kind of a small project, but it's how we try to help to restore uh, part of the coral reef in Okinawa that we lost for land reclamation. Another thing more general, and that is not an example of Okinawa, my, one, my last slide, and that is more related to blue economy. So as I told you, coral reefs are adapted to extreme environment, but also a lot of the population living around the coral reef are adapted to this extreme environment, particularly in this area. This is called Gordon Triangle with, between Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Papua New Guinea. And these are very populated areas. So Indonesia is the uh, most populated island in the world. There is billions of people. Uh, they are very poor country. And there is a lot of indigenous people which they rely only, and in terms of food, uh, uh, food uh, on coral reef. And I'll give you an example. This is a picture I took in Papua New Guinea, Upapazina Reef in Norman Bay, two years ago. This is a local population, indigenous population, living on a very isolated island. They don't have electricity, they don't have cars, they don't have running water, uh, they don't go to school. The only source, they don't have agriculture, they don't have any other animal except dogs, but they don't eat them. So the only food for them is the reef, is the fish from the reef. And of course, they find that because of climate change, the number of fish they decline. And because they don't have any other means of food, these people, they get to extreme a solution to get more fish. For example, when we went there, this population was fishing using dynamite, which you don't need to be a marine scientist to understand that throwing a dynamite in the coral reef is not good. So how we help them? So when we go to our expedition to study coral reef, we try to educate them for sustainability. Here is me in the back. Here is a uh, people, we are showing a. Uh, educational video. This, some of these kids, they never saw a computer in their life, a TV, you can see the face, how uh, things. So the point I want to make here, and I finish, is that uh, because of the human impact in other parts of the world, unfortunately, these are the population that actually they don't produce CO2, they don't contribute to climate change, but actually they suffer the most of the concept of climate change. So we need to really think about how we can protect this population. So to conclude, I want to thank all my team. This, we are lucky hoist, as David said, is a very international. So we are all here to study in our coral reef, but you can see all my team come from all over the world, Japan, US, Europe, and so forth. And thank you for your attention. Thanks, Tim. Great presentation. Uh, Charlotte, let's go to you. You've got the floor. Thank you so much. Um, so Tim, you need to stop sharing. Hold on, let me, let me try and share. There we go. Okie dokie. Good morning, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Charlotte. I am the global lead for the Blue Economy at the World Bank. I would like to start by thanking the organizers 
Warm thanks to the Ocean Society and OIST and um, and Tim, I, I have starfish in my eyes. I don't have stars in my eyes. Thank you for the brilliant presentation. Right, so I think the way Tim presented was a very good segue. I'm gonna talk a little bit from um, about the same issues, but from a development perspective. So I work for the World Bank. The World Bank is a multilateral development bank focused on reducing extreme poverty and enhancing shared prosperity. In this context, we work with um, many countries in the world, uh, providing technical assistance, but also uh, financial support as they seek development. And in many cases, this development is going to be ocean development. Think of some small island states, um, Tim mentioned Micronesia, uh, we work in the Pacific and elsewhere. And so in this context, we have to recognize that um, ocean is, is, the oceans are an engine for development. And I've put together some, um, some numbers you know, from the World Bank, so we use numbers and I'm gonna try and keep it light, but the scope, the extent to which people depend on oceans for their livelihoods and for their development, is absolutely astounding. So these are figures that we've gathered from the FAO, from OECD, and from a number of sister agencies with whom we work. But broadly speaking, you can think about one in 10 livelihoods depending on fisheries. And by livelihoods, I mean not just the fishermen, but their families, the processors, the boat builders. Think about it from a vertical integration perspective. In the case of small island developing states in particular, the reliance on fish protein is tremendous. Q, um, Tim's point about the reliance um, on fish protein in that village he was working in. So uh, our colleagues at OECD did a fantastic job trying to put a number on the ocean economy. So you will notice that for now, I'm talking about ocean economy and not blue economy. And the conservative estimate by the OECD was that the ocean economy writ large globally was about $1.5 trillion. And they expect it to double to $3 trillion by 2030. Um, another important figure is we know that 80% of all goods are shipped and think um, shipping transport and pollution, you're already probably uh, drawing a picture in your mind. And then a very strong emphasis on ocean tourism, which again is expected to double between 2010 and 2030. Again, Tim's excellent point about Hyatt and the development of, of hotel tourism in Okinawa. But perhaps more importantly, or equally importantly, oceans uh, constitute the largest carbon sink on Earth. So Tim has been talking about the impacts of climate change on, on, on oceans, but we also need to think about, from a mitigation perspective, the fact that oceans play a, a tremendous role, a key ecological in as a carbon sink, um, and therefore mitigation measure for climate change. So again, Tim has started um, hinting at this, but basically we are in trouble. So we know that oceans are a, a tremendous engine for development, and yet we cannot but recognize the fact that our exploitation, what we've been heard as uh, referred to as the human factor, is actually uh, quite detrimental. So we have climate change, and I'm not going to repeat what has been um, said very eloquently, um, fishing over exploitation of fisheries, um, broadly speaking, you can think about 60% of stocks are fished at full capacity, but 20% are overfished, and they're basically in an ecological trouble. We have some issues with uh, stable aquaculture, which is not yet um, stepping up as a substitute. And then obviously pollution is perhaps the most visible uh, impact on oceans. And I'm willing to take a bet. We can do an informal survey. Everybody has heard about marine plastics, which are a tremendous issue, but think about it as a proxy. Think about it as an illustration of the problem. 80% um, of, of marine pollution is from land-based sources. So land-based, ocean, very difficult way of managing this integration. And then if you look at it that way, we know oceans are important for development, but we're also we're developing them to death. And we're in a situation where we need to effect a trade-off between long-term sustainability and short-term need for growth. Again, Tim's point about the fishing village where you don't have electricity, you don't have school, you don't have probably um, health. That is a case where you, you know, where you really want to explore ways of, of uh, enhancing development and reducing poverty. 
So out of this almost, it's almost a, it's a tension. It's not a conflict, but it's a tension. So I'm, I'm going to give you the, the uh, definition by the bank that we've, we've um, developed of, over years. And, and we're looking at, it's not just ocean development, but we're talking about the development of the oceanic sectors that I mentioned, tourism, fisheries, um, shipping, et cetera. But in two very important factors. First, it has to be done sustainably. So you have to find a way to limit the impact on ocean health. And second, you have to do it in an integrated fashion. And, and this means a complete break from business as usual. Um, if you look at any um, traditional mode of ocean development, you will have a minister of fisheries that looks going to look at your fish. You're going to have a minister of transport that's going to look at shipping, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't have this integration. And the problem is activities in one sector are going to have an impact on other sectors. So at Bank, what we're trying to see is what better ways, what better approach do we have to, to sort of develop this development and integration and uh, integrated in a sustainable way? Right, so that's what we call the blue economy. And we are focusing both on traditional uses, the ones you know about fisheries, tourism, maritime transport, but also new and emerging activities. And here think offshore renewable energy. You may know about the importance of offshore wind. Offshore wind is one um, energy, is one sector that has tremendous potential. But think about it that way. If you start putting um, wind farms in the ocean, what kind of impact is going to have? not only on marine ecosystems, but also on all the other uses that used to um, prevail in the ocean. Uh, aquaculture, uh, seaweed farming, for instance, is, 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 a, is a sector with potential growth, and then bioprospecting. And that is probably one where I would refer to the experts at OIST and, and other scientific institutions that can really demonstrate the value that can be extracted from um, marine uh, species. And, and this collaboration needs to happen not only at the national level, but think about it. So I really liked uh, Tim's point about, about the map and you see how close um, the islands were to Okinawa and you look at the region, it's obvious that everything needs to be, to be happening in an integrated way in a coordinated fashion throughout the region. So at the World Bank, we, um, we have been looking at these sectors and thank you, uh, Rob, for the shout out for uh, some convenience. It's available on the, uh, the bank's website. It's a bit depressing, but you know, we have to start by uh, understanding the problem. But also we've been looking at the um, offshore wind uh, potential. And then we realized, hold on, we're missing the picture if we're just looking at a series of sectors. So we've developed this approach where we're really looking at how everything relates to everything else. And you can look at this figure and think that would be something that a SID, a small island developing state, needs to think about, needs to look at, and needs to look at the linkages and the interaction. Um, so let me just point out something important, which is so much that happens that ends up in the ocean originates on land. So unfortunately, as, as a fishery specialist, I fortunately actually, but I have to put a sort of a, almost a terrestrial hat and look at what's happening on land that's having an impact um, on oceans. So um, I don't want to uh, flood you with too many um, details about the approaches. I would just uh, note briefly that within the World Bank, we have an ocean portfolio that exceeds $9 billion. So we have $9 billion in operations, meaning loans, grants, and everything else. So just to give you a sense um, of the scope. So again, I think it's important. The blue economy is not the ocean economy. It's, it's a distinction with a difference. And for us, the blue economy is an approach. How do we go away from business as usual and how do we do better? Um, so this is a way, this is a little bit inside baseball because it is inside um, the World Bank, but these are all the sectors that we need to deal with, climate change, urban, for waste, agriculture, for agriculture runoff, transport, for shipping, extractives, for offshore wind, um, in a private sector specialist for coastal tourism, et cetera, et cetera. And then the two sort of really underlying themes that we keep going back to over and over and over again are gender and climate change, because these are the two factors that we need to incorporate in our blue economy approach if we hope to be um, successful and sustainable. So we've developed a number of products. We have, um, uh, we've worked with our um, UN agencies, IMO for shipping, FAO for fisheries, IOC for science, 
et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm throwing a lot of information at you, but everything is on the website and I'll be very happy to, um, to, to share with everybody. And I want to end with a special emphasis on, on climate change. And ironically, the way we've changed a little bit about how we think about climate change is the concept of shock. And you have either short-term shocks, and here, for instance, the 2005 tsunami, everything that it did in South Asia for coastal management, um, which caught everybody by surprise, multi-year, but also caught by surprise COVID-19, and then much more better understood and much more foreseeable climate change. Now, it doesn't mean that it's easier. If anything, climate change is perhaps more difficult to manage because um, as, as was mentioned before, often the impacts, particularly on the most vulnerable countries, have nothing to do with the source of the problem. The source of the problem is development, 200 years of economic developments that have created the uh, CO2 emissions that have created climate change. And yet the price is being borne by the most vulnerable. So for instance, with sea level rise, it's Pacific Island states that are at threat of, um, of disappearing. So um, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail, and I believe my time is probably up. But what I want to say is that what we're trying to do and what we're focusing on is a framework, um, obviously, with the World Bank. So we're focusing on uh, fiscal measures. We are helping governments um, with uh, identifying the issues, quantifying them, addressing them. And um, I'm happy to report that in this context, um, the World Bank was able to create a multi-donor trust fund called ProBlue, where we have been working with about 14 states and have raised some $200 million to provide hand-on technical um, assistance. And I'm going to leave it at that and give it back to Rob. Thank you. Tim and Charlotte, thanks so much. I'm going to channel everybody that's on the, on the YouTube webinar and clap. Everybody is uh, engaged with my clapping here. Thanks so much for that. You know, those were both tour de force talks. Um, you packed an amazing amount into the time allotted. And, and I wanna say what, what really struck me is that the combination of the two talks really kind of forced us all to think about that transition from science to action, science to policy, science to change. And I have to say, that's something that we're still learning how to do. And, and I have no doubt it's a place where OIST and World Bank and the Japan Society can, can help, right, to foster this. Um, we're a community with a lot of scientific knowledge and ideas about solutions. And there's obviously some funding available, but, but it's how do we put it all together to use it the right way? And that's what I meant when I talked about SMART, but let's let's start with a few minutes of discussion. Those of you on the webinar, um, please feel free to enter questions into the YouTube question area, and our secret moderator, Ben, will, will get those to me somehow, and, um, and I'll call them out. But first, uh, here's a question for both of you, and this links your two talks. Uh, what elements of of development of the blue economy, and I love the World Bank definition, by the way, it's the, it's the only sustainable one I've heard. Um, what elements of development of the blue economy also help mitigate the most damaging elements of ocean climate change? And why don't you take a stab at that first, Charlotte, and then Tim. Thank you, Rob. That's that's a really good question. So I'm, I'm going to be a little bit cheeky because I'm going to line it up for, for Tim to come in. Rob, to me, the most important thing is, again, the focus on ocean health. And we have to stop destroying. And we have to stop destroying uh, coastal ecosystems, coral reefs, mangroves. Uh, there's an ecological justification, which is obvious, for instance, from a, from a climate change perspective. And, and, and this is what we've been trying to show for so we use hard economic figures, right? And so for instance, sunken billions, we, we um, value the, um, the sunken billions, the, the money lost to overfishing to more than $80 billion a year. It's a shocking figure and we hope governments are going to, um, to uh, notice. But I wanna give the floor, I wanna, I wanna pass to Tim because for me, one of the most important things is we, we have to understand what we protect and we have to value what we protect. And the only way we can do that is with the best science available. And, and 
Tim, I think I hope that's, yeah, that's, I, that's. I totally agree with you. Thanks, Charlotte. So first of all, we don't know what we destroying yet. <clears throat> so we don't know exactly what is the, especially when it comes to the ocean, we don't really know what is the biodiversity, uh, which species are there. So, you know, understand what is still there and, you know, and how we can protect it. That is the first step because we don't know what is there yet. Or we know a lot, but not everything. So I think that is, uh, is a one first point. I totally agree. The other thing, I think, Rob, uh, you know, uh, again, based on research, you know, try other uh, ways like solar uh, uh, research, so, you know, try alternative to carbon, uh, you know, emission of carbon uh, dioxide. So, and, and again, we are kind of behind that. So, and I think that invest uh, more in the research or alternative energy, that could be also uh, something that's to start with because it will take a long time. So. No, that, that's a good answer. And just a short follow-up, you know, you mentioned mangroves, Charlotte. And, you know, so, I mean, can you imagine that many of our coastal nations um, could actually, you know, realistically look at blue carbon and carbon credits as part of their blue carbon economy and in near term development? And is there a way to kind of fertilize that with some seed funding? So th thank you for that, Rob. One of the, um, by the way, I was, I was very positive in my um, explanation of the blue economy, but at the end of the day, breaking from business as usual means more additional resources. So, you know, we have, we have a trust fund and we can do a little bit, we can seed some projects, but ultimately I think the bank recognizes that the bulk of the financing, Rob, is gonna to have to come from the private sector. And so, yes, the issue of blue carbon is the most important one. We know, we know undeniably that there's more sequestration in, in mangrove than basically anywhere else. And yet those mangroves are being destroyed because of coastal development, because of charcoal, because you name it. Um, so we, we just had a, a major study on published on this last year. And the value of mangroves is increasing economic value because what they're protecting, as in the coastal community, the value is increasing. So it is frustrating. And we are looking at it. We don't have a silver bullet. Why is it that so much more has been done on terrestrial carbon sequestration and trading, carbon trading, if you will, and we haven't cracked that nut yet on, on blue carbon? But we are 100% we are committed to try and find a way. Yeah, my buddies here at Stanford that are lawyers, um, and they, they tell me the problem with blue carbon is investors want, want um, people to be able to point to where their carbon is stored. <laughs> and it's harder in the ocean than in a building, but it's different from mangrove. Uh, and I think what you're saying is that we might, when we do ecosystem services, economic analyses, that there are ways to link uh, terrestrial nearshore environments with the ocean. Let me ask a different question. This, um, Tim, this, I don't think this will be a long answer, but I have to say we were all super impressed with the sounds on your videos. And we listened to what you were saying very carefully, but the sounds were spectacular. It was like a symphony of the sea. Do you, do you think that the soundscape is useful for understanding the health of these systems? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. So uh, not myself, but our colleague now looking into soundscape. Uh, you know, to assess the health of the ecosystem. So the first video I show, that's the most impressive thing, right? The sound, right? Because this is created by the biomass, right? More coral there is, more sound there is, more fish there are, more sound there are. So yeah, I think that uh, soundscape is, uh, is very important to as a monitoring system uh, for uh, the health of the ecosystem. But also people start to understand that uh, noise, human generated noise, like boat noise and so forth, they impact, uh, you know, uh, biodiversity, they impact the, the biology of fish. For example, clownfish have been shown that uh, if you put it in a noisy arbor, right, so they reproduce less, they make less baby. So, and uh, so, yeah, sound, I think, is the next uh, the big stress that we should take into account. Yeah, and no, maybe sound coupled with the kind of environmental DNA and genomics that you guys are pioneering there. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll start with um, questions from our broad audience in a moment, but I've got a couple of more short ones. Charlotte, in, in one of your slides, you showed um, the SIDS nations are 
listed them and you know i think there's 54 95 percent of them have coral reefs um most of them are are quite poor with a few outliers like singapore but uh and we've you know some of your slides focused on fish and fisheries but i wondered is there any do you see any any low-hanging fruit for the sid stations uh for blue economy uh, growth that you that you'd like us all to be aware of. Uh, you know, a number of people ask, "How can we help?" and "How can we steer things in the right direction?" and and I often think about that on behalf of the SIDS. Mm -hmm. Great, that's a good question, Rob. So I would say what all SIDS have in common is a, a disproportionate dependence on transport. So if you think about why um, tourism doesn't take off in the Pacific the way it could. It's because of the cost of air transport. But then again, all these SIDs are completely entirely 100% dependent on shipping. So I would say that is a low lying fruit. So for instance, we're looking right now at the decarbonization of shipping because we've been looking at air pollution from shipping. Um, the kind of fuel that's being burned on the ships is the most, the dirtiest um, and, and the most polluting. And then you can kill the two, you know, two birds with one stone by focusing on decarbonization because you don't produce CO2 emission and you produce clean. So you can look, for instance, in Scandinavia, all ferries are electric. Now, of course, in the case of SIDS, they're much further apart and, and that is something that we need to focus on. I would argue that isolation uh, for many SIDS has been a hindrance, but also an advantage. The reason why Tahiti and Micronesia, uh, the ecosystems look much, much better and much cleaner is because the tour mass tourism hasn't developed. So we are focusing a lot on, on, on sustainable coastal tourism. And I'm just gonna say that ironically, um, nature got a big break with COVID, including from the absence of transport and the absence of um, unfettered uh, tourism uh, activity. So I would say tourism in many cases, if it's done well, um, it's a big if, uh, it has tremendous potential, but the, the danger is to, you don't wanna look for a silver bullet where all you do is tourism, because then you're going to destroy the carrying capacity. Yeah, I know. Good answer. Say, Tim, here's a quick one. Um, how representative is the coral decline of Okinawa to coral declines in the rest of the world? And it, you see a way that Okinawa could become a study site or a demonstration site for solutions? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, actually, Okinawa, compared to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia or the Caribbean coral, is actually in a good condition. Uh, because uh, we are a temperate reef, right? Subtropical place. And I think uh, what people think is the coral here is, uh, you know, is adapted to, uh, to, to basically respond better to changing temperature, seasonal changing yeah. temperature. And I think that's uh, <clears throat> compared to maybe a more tropical reef like, uh, you know, in Hawaii, Tahiti, this kind of places. And I think that's... Uh, um, yeah, it could be because of this and because of this uh, type of coral ecosystem, subtropical, could be uh, a very good study site, especially in the context of tropicalization, shifting ecosystem, northbound or southbound. So that's what we're doing also here at Hoist. So, yeah, it could be a very nice natural laboratory. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Yeah. Listen, everyone, we're going to switch to questions from the audience, and I'm going to pick and choose to kind of keep us flowing. Um, and they're great questions. Congratulations to you guys to, for coming up with these really interesting questions. Um, this first one's for Charlotte. And, and I like it because the question came up in a faculty meeting at Stanford today. Uh, and the question is, what is the relationship between gender and climate change? Can Charlotte elaborate on the point you made? Sure. So I would, I would say the reason I, I talked about both concepts in, uh, in the same breath is because you can't have sustainable development if you don't keep both at, at the forefront of your mind. Uh, Rob, the way I like to talk about gender is if you ignore women, you're ignoring half of the solutions. Um, so uh, the problem is that, for instance, in fisheries in particular, women are not necessarily represented or monetized or compensated. But I can tell you, you, you go anywhere in the world, a man cannot go on his boat fishing if his wife is not taking care of the kids, fixing the nets, saving, running the books, you know. Um, so, so it's really this, this idea that um, 
looking at gender should not be a problem, but it should open up the solutions. Um, and, um, and and basically, in all these oceanic activities, you're going to have an intersection with with women, and women are key economic actors in a household. Again, in many cases, not recognized or compensated, and that's the problem. That's why they're not necessarily taken into account. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. And you you probably know that OIS has major initiatives to to deal with gender balance issues in the sciences. STEM has a problem all over, uh, but many of us are working hard to redress that. Um, for Tim, this is an audience question. You mentioned that you don't see coral bleaching in Okinawa. And does that mean that the ocean around Okinawa is healthier? Um, no, so uh, I don't think it's healthier because of the problem I, I, I show in my presentation, like cost of development, overfishing, and, uh, and we have a lot of, I didn't mention, we have a lot of plastic pollution in the East China Sea. So if you go on a beach now, it's full of plastic, plastic bottles. So I don't think it's healthier. I think that the coral, as what I was saying to Rob, uh, answering Rob's question before, I think the coral here somehow is more resistant or resilient to uh, changing in temperature because maybe it's more used to, uh, because seasonally the temperature in Okinawa changed quite you know, few degrees compared to the water around uh, uh, Papua New Guinea, where I showed the, the picture earlier, or Tahiti, so forth. I think that is, is more related to the, uh, how this coral reef evolves in this uh, temperate reef, or uh, like temperate, uh, subtropical reef. So I think that that's the reason. But the, the, in, in the South China Sea is not a healthy sea. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, you're kind of talking about refugia and, I, you know, I read in the New York Times this morning that that um, the temperatures in parts of the Australian uh, Great Barrier Reef are the highest ever on record and they're expecting a massive bleaching event. And, and so, you know, what about engineered refugia? Like, could you imagine that, that Okinawa ends up becoming a place where, you know, you create populations and maintain them so that they can be used to repopulate other parts of the mm -hmm. ocean. Yeah, absolutely. So that is what um, our colleague Nori Sato, you mentioned before he sequenced the coral genome, is a professor at Hoist. He has uh, a restoration project and a kind of adaptative uh, potential of coral project where uh, using Okinawa coral, he tried to see if he can uh, basically uh, select uh, coral that is more resistant, right, to uh, to change in temperature using the standing variation, genetic variation we have here in Okinawa, because as I mentioned, it, we think that it is you know um, is more resistant naturally, is more resistant to temperature. Yeah. Good. Thank you, audience, for letting me jump in on your question. Here's a question from the audience for Charlotte. Um, the concept of the blue economy is recognized to be central for sustainability. And, and how far has that notion penetrated among the nations of the world? So I'm, I'm going to put my optimistic hat on um, because, because we've all heard of the concept. It's not necessarily perfectly understood and like I said, there's a bit of confusion between the ocean economy and the blue economy. Do you know when we talked about green growth, it took what, five, six, seven years for people to get it. So that's okay. It's a complex issue. And, and like I said, it's expensive. So it takes, you know, it takes additional resources. But what we understand is, for instance, better integration is going to have better outcomes, right? So I would say, Rob, what's interesting is we have a couple of countries where uh, the governments have really taken the bull by the horns and they have blue economy national strategies. You have the high level panel notion that's made some very strong recommendations for integrated ocean management. It doesn't matter how you call it, but I would, I would argue, and it's not just about sustainability. Yes, think about when you put uh, wind farm about the ecological impacts, but also think about the other users you are displacing, right? Because that's, that's the human impact. And at the end of the day, if you don't manage this, it's going to have an ecological impact. So I would say, I, I can't quantify it, but if you go to symposia, we have the UN Oceans meeting happening in uh, Lisbon in, um, in June and July. And you know, watch, watch that space. You will see 
that it is coming up more and more again. And this is why we are incredibly proud of the World Bank. We have embraced the concept. We are working on all the economic underlying tools. And we've even been able to raise some resources. And we kind of make putting our money where our mouth is when it comes to that. Yeah, no, good answer. I agree that Lisbon is going to be super important to kind of keep people on task. And I, I'm heartened by entities such as the um, Seabed uh, Authority that is talking about how to manage mining in high seas waters. Um, we need that for all the other problems too. Here's a question from the audience for both of you. Uh, this one is sparked by one of your slides, I think, Tim. How can we leverage the public's love of Nemo and dolphins to encourage them to invest in protecting oceans and coral reefs? And, you know, at a broader scale, like it's a changed world with media. Like, are we using it right to get these messages across? Thoughts from both of you. Well, let me start. So actually, uh, ironically, uh, the 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 fact that Nemo, the movie, come out and become so famous and uh, the clownfish to become the most recognizable fish in the world, it was not really good for the population of clownfish because, you know, the increase, uh, you know, the butchery here in Okinawa, right? People just go diving and collecting and put in aquaria. That's is the, talking with the fishermen that have been here longer than me, they told me that that increased dramatically after the Nemo movie came out. Actually, so um, it's a good question. I don't know how we can level it because we have to be careful, right? So uh, to, to use this kind of Q type of fish or dolphin, uh, uh, you know, um, you know to, uh, for awareness because maybe people are taking it in, a, in, a, in the wrong direction. So I think that's, uh, yeah. So uh, of course, in our project here in Okinawa, we leverage Nemo with the IAT and the uh, tourist industry. Uh, because, you know, it's very famous in Okinawa, but again, we have to be careful. So, yeah, I, I don't really know the answer to the question. I'll believe Charlotte has a better idea than me. So we struggle with the same question, but it's it's undeniable that um, there is a leverage, leveraging effect. Oh, by the way, it was a great movie, scientifically completely wrong, but very good movie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Tim can tell us all the ways it was wrong scientifically. Yeah. Um, what, what we don't want to do, Rob, what I would warn is it's not about stop eating fish. That's not true. If you stop eating fish, you jeopardize the livelihood of one in 10 in the world. Again, 60% of the stocks of fish are managed sustainably. Um, so it's more about, it's about awareness. Um, yes, we got rid of uh, the plastic straws, it's fantastic. But if you don't have good solid waste management uh, at, at the broad scale, it's not gonna change any of the problems. I like the issue of awareness. I like, I think the idea that constituents can keep their decision makers, the pressure of those decision makers. And again, what I think we need to do is we need to get a few wins. We need to get uh, projects that work, coral reef restoration. I know it's tiny, it's a drop in the bucket, but we need, we need to be storytellers. We can't just be right. We have to know how to explain the difficult science and sometimes the hard economic choices that need to be made. Yeah, I totally agree. So that's what we try to do is like small thing and like just show that it can work, right? With scientific data, that's what we try to do with the clownfish restoration project, the coral restoration project. These are no massive project. Right? We will not solve the problem of the coral in the world, but if it's working, right, and we have the data to prove it, scientific data to prove it for a period of few years. So that is a big weapon we have in our hand to go to stakeholder and, you know, and say, listen, we can do this. No, thanks, you guys. And, I, you know, I, there is actually one last question here. Uh, and, and I, in the interest of following the uh, guidance of our sponsors to end on time. I'm just going to answer it. It's about COVID-19 and is it uh, helping us save the oceans? And absolutely, at some sites, the stoppage of tourism, uh, our dive operators and colleagues have reported unbelievable recoveries of fish, you know. So there's things to be learned there, no doubt. But I do want to close this out on time. And I uh, I'm glad you both mentioned storytelling and, and getting a few wins up on the board because you're both consummate storytellers and you gave us examples of some things that are already wins on the board. And 
honestly, in my experience uh, from an audience like ours here, joining us through the Japan Society and OIST, it's like it's illustrating those wins that get people engaged. So my hat goes off to you. Thank you so much. I do want to thank the Japan Society and OIST for co-hosting. I want to thank our audience for sticking with us and hang and look for more of these because believe me, we want to do more and we want to let you know what's going on in Lisbon with IPCC and the UN and all of those things. So um, stay tuned and thanks to Charlotte and Tim for educating us today. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Rob.